Okay, today we're going to learn lesson two of unit four, products and quotients of functions, which are very similar to what we have learned yesterday. Yesterday we have learned sums and differences of functions, right? So today let's have a look at products and quotients. First, let's have a look at the learning goals. After this lesson, you are expected to understand that a combined function of the form y equals fx multiplied by gx represents the product of two functions, fx and gx. Understand that a combined function of the form y equals fx over gx represents the quotient of the two functions, fx and gx, for gx is not zero. Understand that the domain of the product or quotient of functions is the domain common to the component functions. The domain of the quotient function y equals fx over gx is further restricted by excluding any values that makes the denominator gx equal to zero. And understand that products and quotients of functions can be used to model a variety of situations. Okay, so again, let's use some example questions to illustrate these concepts. First, suppose we have a function fx equals x plus three and gx equals x squared plus eight x plus 15. Determine an equation for each combined function below. Sketch a graph of the fun combined function and state its domain and range respectively. So first, y equals the product of x, fx, and gx. Second, y equals the quotient between fx and gx. Okay, I'll give you uh, 15 minutes to think about this question first. And then after that, we'll have a look at the solutions together, all right?
right? Let's have a look at the solutions of this question. So first of all, let's have a look at question A. Y equals product of fx and gx, right? To determine y, we can multiply these two functions, which is a product of x plus 3 and x squared plus 8x plus 15, right? And we can expand this using the distributive flows. And the final result is x cubed plus 11x squared plus 39x plus 45. And as you can see here, this is actually a polynomial function, which we have discussed in the very beginning of unit one, right? And use the fact, you can use the fact that gx can be factored to x plus 3 squared times x plus 5 to help you sketch the graph of this, this cubic function, right? So the leading coefficient is positive 1. And the highest order is 3, which is an odd number. That means this function will have a shape like extending from the third quadrant to first quadrant, right? And we know that there are two zeros. One of them is minus 5, and the other one is minus 3. And um, this function extends all the way from third quadrant. First, it derives the first zero, which is minus 5, because minus 5 is, it, it has an order 1. So this function changes sign here. And then it crosses the next zero, which is minus 3. So note here, minus 3 has a order of 2, right? So this function does not change sign, but bounces back and extends all the way to the first quadrant. So this function, the combined function, will have a sketch like this, right? And usually we'll calculate its y coordinate, or y intercept and x intercept. x intercept is minus 5, 0 and minus 3, 0. And to calculate this y intercept, we can just let x be 0, right? That means y equals 0 plus 0 plus 0 plus 45. So 45 here. And so the y intercept here is 0, 45. So this is a complete sketch of the combined function, right? Which is also illustrated in the graph on the right. So you can use knowledge we have learned in unit one to analyze and sketch the graph of the polynomial function. So as you can see here, there are no restrictions on x or y. So the domain is x belongs to the real number set and the range is also the real number set. Okay, please have a look at this and any questions, please let me know.
Okay, next let's have a look at question B. To determine y equals fx over gx, we can divide the two functions. The denominator is, uh, the numerator is x plus 3 and denominator is x plus 3 times x plus 5, right? And note here the domain is x is not minus 3 and x is not minus 5. So we can cancel x plus 3 here. Pay attention here, if you, if you cancel x plus 3, you need to specify that the domain is x is not minus 3 because if you only have this expression, you can't decide, you can't have the uh, domain from this expression. Uh, this expression itself doesn't indicate that x cannot be minus 3, right? So we need to specify that x is not minus 3 after the cancellation of x plus 3. So apparently uh, this is a rational function, right? Which is a reciprocal of a linear function. Again, we have already studied the property of such functions. So we can sketch the graph by applying a horizontal translation of five units to the left of the function, y equals one over x, right? And to identify the domain of this function, refer to the original form of, of the function, which is this one, right? And as you can see here, the denominator cannot be zero. So that means x plus three cannot be zero and x plus five cannot be zero. That means x cannot be minus 3 and x cannot be minus 5. So the domain is x belongs to real number set but x cannot be minus 5 or minus 3. Okay. And note here the blue curve here, uh, let's see the first graph. If we graph this function here, actually this function, the blue curve includes the point of x being 3, right? But domain states that x cannot be minus 3. So that means we need to exclude the point of x equals 3 and y equals 1 half. So there is a hole in this function's graph, right? So remember to label the hole here minus three, one over two, right? Okay, and also there is a horizontal asymptote at y equals zero. So the range is y belongs to the real number set, but y cannot be zero or one over two. Okay, so please have a look at the solution here and uh, let me know if you have any questions. Pay special attention that there is a hole in the graph of this function, okay? Do not forget this.
Okay, let's have a look at another example of questions. This is a real world problem that involves the combination of two functions. In an effort to boost fund support, the owners of a baseball team have agreed to gradually reduce ticket prices P in dollars according to the function PG, where PG equals 25 minus 0.1 G, where G is the number of games that have been played so far this season. The owners are also randomly given away, giving away free basketball, bas baseball caps. The number C in hundreds of caps given away per game can be modeled by the function CG equals 2 minus 0.04G. Since these marketing initiatives began the number uppercase N in hundreds of fans in attendance has been modeled by the function NG equals 10 plus 0.2G. Question A, develop an algebraic and a graphical model for FG equals PG multiplied by NG and explain what it means. Will the owner increase or decrease their revenue from ticket sales under their current marketing plan? We develop an algebraic and graphical model for FG equals CG over NG and explain what it means. How likely are you to receive a free basketball cap, uh, a baseball cap if you attend game five? Okay, again, I'll give you 15 minutes to think about this question by yourself. And after that, we'll have a look at the solutions together, okay?
Okay, now let's have a look at the solutions together. Question A. So first, let's have a look at FG, which is a multiply, which is a product of PG and NG. So we can multiply PG and NG together, which is the product of 25 minus 0 0.1 G and 10 plus 0 0.2 G. And we can expand it using a distributive law, right? So the final result is minus 0 0.02 G squared plus 4 G plus 250. Again, this is a polynomial function, right? And also, this is a quadratic function with a leading coefficient positive. So this function will open downwards, right? <clears throat> a graph of this function is shown on the right. Note that these functions only have meaning for g is equal to or greater than zero, right? Because g here stands for the number of games played. So g cannot be negative. This combined function is a product of the ticket price and the number of fans attending, right? So that means FG equals the product of PG and NG represents the revenue from ticket sales, right? Because if you times the price per person with the number of total persons, that will give you the total revenues from ticket sales in hundreds of dollars, right? Because N here stands for number of people in hundreds. And note that this function is quadratic, as I said, increasing until about game 100. As you can see here, there is a local maximum here, right? So first of all, if you increase a uh, game number, the revenue will increase, right? Until G reach to the 100, then FG starts to decrease. Therefore, the owners will increase their revenue from ticket sales in the short term under their current marketing strategy. But eventually, this strategy will no longer be effective after the game number reaches 100, right? Okay, now let's have a look at this question. And uh, tell me if you have any questions, okay?
Okay, now let's have a look at question B. Question B, first of all, in order to find FG, which is a ratio between CG and NG, you can use 2 minus 0 0.04G over 10 plus 0.4G, uh, 0.2G, right? And actually, we have discussed a function with a form like this in unit one, right? This is a rational function. First of all, we can find its horizontal and vertical asymptote first, right? And the uh, <clears throat> vertical asymptote is 10 equals 0.2 G, right? Which means G equals minus 50. So we can draw the vertical asymptote first here. And the horizontal asymptote is simply the ratio between these two coefficients, which is minus 0 0.2, right? And after that, so first of all, we decide the two asymptotes. And after that, we can find is x and y intercept. We can let g equal 0. When g is 0, this function f is 2 over 10, which is 0 0.2, right? So the y-intercept is here. And when f is 0, we can solve g is actually 50, right? So x-intercept is here. So that means this function will have two branch. One of them is here, and the other one is here, right? We have discussed this in unit 1. But note here, this is a real world problem. So we need to consider that what is the actual domain? So G stands for the actual number of games played, right? So that means the domain is equal to or greater than zero, right? Also, FG is CG over NG, which, which stands for the probability of receiving a free cap given a game number, right? So usually, uh, uh, so for a probability, probability cannot be over one, right? And the probability cannot be less than zero either. So that means the smallest f is here, which is zero. So that means the domain is zero to 50, right? Inclusive. This is a domain of fg. And to determine the probability of receiving a free cap at game five, simply evaluate f5, right? So f5 is 2 minus 0 0.04 times 5 over 10 plus 0 0.2 times 5, which we can solve. The result is 0 0.163. <clears throat> and according to the equation, there is about 16% chance of receiving a free baseball cap at game five. And the sketch of FG in terms of G is shown here, okay? All right, so please have a look at the solution here and uh, let me know if you have any questions.
Okay, now let's make a summary of what we have learned for today. Today we have learned that the combined function of the form y equals product of fx and gx represents the product of two functions, fx and gx. And a combined function of the form of y equals fx over gx represents the quotient of two functions, fx and gx. Of course, gx is the denominator, which is not zero, right? And also the domain of the product and or quotient of the functions is a domain common to the component functions. The domain of quotient function y equals fx over gx is further restricted by excluding any values that make the denominator gx equal to zero. And last, products and quotients of functions can be used to model a variety of situations. Okay. So this is what we have learned for today. And the rest of the time is reserved for you to complete today's homework and uh, remember to submit them onto Google Classroom before the deadline, all right? You can start now.
Okay, class is over for today. I'll see you next lesson. Remember to submit your homework onto Google Classroom, okay? Bye.